Hello all, welcome back to yet a new Penn Center series. Today we have Vas Cachuala. He's a graduate, he was a graduate student here. He graduated from here. And he was a student of Professor Racers. After he graduated, he worked for Dynatest for some time. And then now he's working for ACOM in Chicago. He's been involved in pavement testing, analysis, and management, both roadway and airports. And today he's going to share a machine learning tool that's very practical, very feasible to use, as I understand. And I'll leave the, the rest to Abbas. So let's welcome him. Thanks, Javier. And uh, thank you all for having me here. Uh, it's uh, great to come and present. Uh, so as Javier uh, introduced me, uh, I, after graduation in uh, 2014, I started working with uh, Dynatest, uh, you may have heard. Uh, from it's a payment engineering firm, and then uh, after that, I um, switched over to Acom, where I'm their payment engineer in Chicago. Uh, so the talk I'm going to present today is the development of machine learning based quality control approach for uh, automated payment condition data. Uh, just before I start, a uh, show of hands, uh, people who are currently working with uh, automated payment condition data, which is image based uh, condition data uh, collection. Anybody here working out there? Okay, that's fine. We'll go through, um, and then hopefully this will spring some more research topics. But certainly, uh, the work that we do, as, at least in consulting, it's it, the need or the this quality based approach is very important. As you're aware, we need to deliver data to the clients, and of course, uh, quality is important. And the need for coming up with these new methods, which I'm going to present today, is project based. We get the data, and then we say, okay, how do we? find the best way to uh, you know, reach a solution, and that's where we come up with these tools to make sure that we can get there more efficiently. So uh, this presentation background, I'll uh, we'll just go through a little bit of the background before we go through, uh, you know, getting to the main body of the uh, presentation. Uh, then we'll see why uh, we actually had to develop such a method, uh, touch upon the method uh, or the implementation of it, uh, and then just findings and conclusion, and then Looking ahead, what more is required in this uh, particular field? So, study background, um, payment condition, uh, it's been going on for a long time. Obviously, started in the 70s, mainly by the military. That, at that point, it was manual based, uh, where uh, you know inspectors used to go out and pick up. It still happens, uh, certainly, uh, uh, the, the manual condition survey, but start off at airports. Now, it's airports, roads, and parking, uh, municipalities, counties, states. Um, Facilities like uh, rail facilities, power plant facilities, that's a lot of our projects are there. So essentially payment condition, uh, uh, data analysis happens anywhere where you see payments. Uh, everybody wants to uh, manage their payments e efficiently. And so, you know, getting, gathering this payment condition and managing it, uh, managing the payments cost effectively is essentially everybody's goal. Uh, after that, you know, there was vehicle-based survey uh, where um, you know it, people thought that okay, we need a more faster, a practical way to pick up this data, especially on roadways um, and maybe runways where you cannot have the runway closed for that long. So that's where uh, the uh, vehicle-based data collection started. Uh, however, at that time, still the the rating or the condition analysis used to be done through radars. So the data used to be collected by the by the vehicle, the images. Um, right away images, download images, but the data used to actually be rated by the rater, which was technically some people used to say automated, but it was in true sense semi-automated because only data collection was kind of vehicle based, but then rating was done manually. And then finally now what we are is the most widely used is the automated, uh, complete automation, which is where the data is collected by the vehicle, as well as now their systems uh, well, machine learning systems or uh, artificial intelligence systems that are detecting cracks. So you essentially just run the data through these systems which go in and detect your cracks, classify the cracks and say, this is the output. So that's where we are currently. Uh, certainly all three systems are still in place depending on the type of facility. Like for example, on aprons, you really don't have straight lines. So you can't do, you, not very efficiently, you can go and run a, a vehicle. Um, parking lots the same. So um, certainly a mix of everything, but uh, the automated one is certainly a very popular system that is picking up and used widely all over the country. So this is the data collection vehicle. Uh, just briefly touching upon because you probably understand and 
uh, see how this plays into it, uh, into the uh, collection later on. But you have, if people have not seen a vehicle in a, in a practical or in real life, it's this back, at the back you have these LCMS images, LCMS cameras, which is a laser crack measuring system. Uh, although it's a camera, it's essentially not gathering an image, it's just forming a grayscale through pixels. So it's very high resolution downward imagery of the, uh, of the pavement. And that's at the back. At the front, you have a right-of-way image, a uh, right-of-way camera that captures images. That's like, again, just for reference purposes. And then you have all your fancy stuff of like your GPS, and you have a front profiler that has lasers that gathers rotting data or profile data, uh, geometry, and then you have a distance measuring system and all of that. So essentially, the two main components are the LCMS system, which is the cameras at the back of the vehicle facing downwards that is capturing uh, the downward uh, image of the pavement at every millimeter and then that stitches it up into a, uh, a continuous image and then your right away image in the front. Uh, the advantage of this is the, the back, the, down, the, the camera on the back, the LCMS is in, essentially infrared illuminated so you don't have to have daylight so on airports at night when you have like two hours of closure you can run this really quick and you don't need uh, daylight for this. So, well, as in manual, uh, you obviously have to have daylight, otherwise you wouldn't see a, see a crack, or you need a light tower or something of that sort. So, uh, several reasons why this is gaining popularity. So, uh, just real quick, advantages we've spoken, of, uh, spoken through some of them. Safety uh, on roadway, especially, you rather have inspectors, instead of having inspectors on roadways where, you know, there could be a safety concern, you have this vehicle, uh, driving through. Uh, the speed of data collection is essentially like you're driving on a regular vehicle. So it's not like you're causing any traffic delays, you don't have any, have to have any closures. It's like, you know, you're just driving as any other vehicle. Drives at traffic speed as well. Um, and then you get a lot of data. So you get imagery, which is a historical imagery. Uh, snapshot in time, you have these gigabytes of imagery that the client has and if they want to know how their payments look back in time when they do data collection, they can just open up the imagery. Uh, and all the other, you know, GPS uh, located, you can map that on RGS. So several uh, advantages of using the system. But however, the biggest question is how reliable is the data, right? Um, you know, you get all of this data, but then is it giving you the same output as manual? Uh, is the is, if at all it's not, then are these advantages greater than what you would, uh, you know, uh, that you can compromise for the data uh, lack of data reliability? So these are some of the questions that need to be answered. So really quick, this is one of the uh, you know popular uh, rating scales and methodologies for uh, um, uh, for data collection is the ASTM. But there are several agencies that have developed their own. Uh, uh, PCI, which is their payment condition index, uh, state agencies sometimes develop their own methodology to calculate. So regardless of how you come up with that number, still, you know, the, the basic inputs of distress stripe, distress, distress severity, quantity, all of that goes into uh, developing this number. Um, where this number is used, so, you know, once you have the distress type, severity, and quantity of multiple distresses that exist, it generates a payment condition index. Now that value is really important, right? Uh, because that is going to be used to determine what are your future <coughs> needs. That's going to determine how much budget you need to plan. So uh, what we've seen is even a value of, say, a, a municipality or a county of 1,000 miles, 1,500 miles, a value of five difference, PCI number of five or four difference can actually fluctuate budgets by millions uh, just because you know, that one area weighted average for the entire county and municipality of that mileage is a, is, a, is a huge significant number. So it is important to kind of have that uh, accuracy while developing this number. And this number is developed by these deduct curves which are coming through the distresses. So again, laying the importance of you need to have reliable distress information to get this number which affects the budgeting the future needs and the maintenance and rehabilitation policies because everything is PCI driven after that once you actually get to that number and that number is developed through the distresses type severity and quantity. Uh, so just uh, kind of summarizing what we've already discussed, advantage of automated condition data, we've seen safety, speed and 
availability of data, and then using that data with advancements in computer technology over the past 10 to 15 years, we've seen machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, that is used to um, identify payment distresses using the imagery. Now the problem statement for this. Uh, what we've seen is uh, serious limitations in machine learning algorithm to identify and classify the payment distress data. So I think what they've got, uh, where the advancement is there, is identifying cracks, but then classifying those cracks into whether is this, this, uh, is this fatigue related, is climate related, is this uh, alligator cracking, is it wheel path, is it non-wheel path, uh, all of that, you know, there's still limitations in there, you know, for the machine to identify that there's a crack, maybe that's <coughs> the easier part, but then classifying those cracks into what, is, what are those important decision making parameters is where limitations are. Accuracy and consistency is, again, uh, where we've seen that there's some limitations in there. And then the common practice methods currently there uh, to verify this data is generally random sampling where you know you have thousand miles, the you know the owner will or the person performing that will just say I'm going to just randomly sample. I'm going to open up here. I'm going to open up these. Check a few things, and if everything looks good, we'll call it a day. But I mean that's really ten percent, fifteen percent, and that's really random. So there's a chance that you may encounter an issue, or if you look at only good roads of a certain neighborhood, you may not even find anything, and you can miss in an entire section or a zone which essentially has the issues. So that random sampling is is not sufficient for quality control. So now let's see, uh, you know, the challenges that we're talking about. How to, where are those challenges, and and and, and uh, you know, why do we need to develop a more systematic quality control approach? Um, so inconsistency, inconsistencies in data results. Now we've seen double counting or duplication. Sometimes we've seen uh, the, the 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 machine actually. Uh, calling one distress over the other. So for example, you have uh, raveling, and then you have pothole, and then you have a crack, it essentially triple counts the same thing. So you're, you're showing a worse number than actual where ASTM s says that, uh, or any other standard may say that, okay, if you're calling this, then do not call the other. But that differentiation cannot be made clearly by the, uh, when you're doing an automated um, system. Uh, limitation in identification classification, we've already spoken about that, uh, inadequacy of quality control techniques, and uh, then the impact of actually having that erroneous data on your funding and maintenance and repair requirements. So some, we'll go through some of the examples now with actual pictures, this is project pictures that we've uh, got, uh, this was 1,500 miles, 1,000 miles, the initial where this system was developed and then it was advanced to another 500 Miles. So in, in, in total, 1,500 miles worth of data that uh, we've, we've collected and we've uh, created this. So this is a perfectly good, recently paved road. Um, the machine thought the cone, the cone here was a raveled area or a pothole. So essentially this new brand new road, which was recently paved, which was 100, with the pothole essentially being the most severe distress, the co uh, it thought that the cone was actually a pothole for some reason, because it saw it, it essentially looks at depth, right? And it looks at different parameters. So it sees some irregularity, it recognizes as that. So this road was rated as 70 for that, when it should have been 100. And that obviously the client will, he knows, or the client definitely knows that, okay, which one I recently paved, and you show, you show that as a yellow or red on a map, that's gonna raise serious concerns. So this is one example where it, uh, stationary objects, even certain things like foliage, debris, uh, you know, it kind of gets a little confused of what those stationary objects are. If you have a tire laying on the road or any of that sort. Man, uh, manual covers or drainage basin. It recognized this as a high, high severity raveling. It thought that this was a crack around that. So several things. Again, this is a brand new road. You don't see any cracking all around. But you see this has been recognized as some kind of distress is occurring. Again, on a, on a new road that deducts, even a small amount like this on a new road, the deduct is significant. Now, if this same detection was on a road that was highly raveled all along, this portion of like say, you know, two, two, or five, two to five square feet wouldn't have made any difference to the overall number. Because anyways, the whole thing is, is broken up. But on a new road or roads that are in good condition, these small amounts of uh, distress identification causes a really high impact. Cobblestones. 
So on, on walkways, it recognized that high severity alligator cracking. So essentially, uh, the whole street recently paved, this whole street was recognized as high severity alligator cracking. As you may aware, may be aware, alligator cracking and potholes are load related or they uh, are classified as load related and they have a very significant deduct on, it, on the PCI. So th this road again, pretty new, it was rated as a failed pavement. And obviously that's not acceptable. Speed bumps the same where if you have a speed bump, it will recognize it as something where actually it, sh it should have been filtered out. Uh, payment markings. You have payment parking everywhere and it recognizes payment cracks. So generally, uh, especially on airport payments, uh, even even for a manual rate actually, uh, you know, there's some confusion sometimes when you lay paint over and the paint cracks rather than the payment not. But of course, you know, it, the machine would get confused but it recognizes everything around that, the paint stripe as a crack and also any cracks within the paint as, as cracking. So again, this is another thing where you know, it, essentially you have paint stripes all along, even the side uh, white lines and yellow lines, so essentially you're calling a crack everywhere, uh, which is, you know, you're showing, and you know, where this would be used essentially in your maintenance policies when you determine the amount of cracking that, is, that you need and you say, I need to do crack sealing, you're essentially saying go and you're, you're accounting for all these quantities of paint cracks to go and do crack sealing, which is again causing a budget problem later on to the client. Uh, concrete gutters. So again, here you have a street here and you recognize the quantity uh, as a concrete gutter as high severity. <coughs> uh, just because it's, the machine was taught to, uh, to, to recognize that, okay, if there's a difference in color in the, in the pavement, recognize it as bleeding. But it obviously interpreted it incorrectly to it being a concrete gutter where it did see a different color but recognizes that high, high severity bleeding. And you would have concrete gutters in so many areas. So again, this was a unique case where, you know, there were cars parked, so the vehicle had to kind of go a little bit off, which did come into the image. Not always it would, but in this case it, would, it did. Uh, but certainly uh, there should be a way to filter that out. Brand new road, the, the, the uh, intercept or the, the uh, curb joint between the curb and the pavement, uh, it recognized that as a crack again. Uh, all the way through. So you have a perfectly new road, how many of miles, and you're calling a crack all the way on the side uh, between the concrete curb and the actual pavement. So um, reducing the number and call, calling uh, longitudinal and transverse cracking on this, which would again seriously affect the quantities and that number. So there are so many instances like this. Um, now, where this is overcalling some of the stress. Now, in, in terms of patching, it does not recognize. So if your patch is a perfectly good patch, which is what we in, which is what we encourage the municipalities or the agencies that, okay, you should build a perfectly flush, brand new patch, everything perfect. The machine doesn't recognize it. It cannot see your difference in surface and all of that. So here, it fails to identify that there's actually a patch. Or even if it would identify, it would identify a crack around the patch, but not recognize it as a patch. So again, there's serious limitations out there. Rutting, this is one of the biggest ones. Um, so the way rutting is collected, if you, uh, if they, when we discuss that vehicle spinning around, uh, so rutting is through lasers in, on your front profiler. You have around seven lasers, sometimes five lasers, depending on uh, the vehicle, how it's set up. Yeah, you have multiple lasers that essentially draws a line and if at all there's a difference in elevation in any of the lasers, it recognizes that there's rotting. Uh, now when you're taking, when you're going up slope, down slope, or taking steep turns, sometimes there's like a little bit of rotation of the vehicle. That it recognizes as rotting. So rotting generally is about half an inch, an inch. In worst circumstances, you maybe go two inch, three inch. Sometimes this has reported five inch rotting, 15 inch rotting. So obviously those numbers we can pick up, but we found that those numbers are being reported in areas where you're either changing lanes, you're taking curves, uh, turns, uh, you're going up slope, you're going down slope, you're suddenly braking. So which are, you know, expected to happen when you're doing data collection. So it's, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the people manufacturing or the, uh, the uh, 
the way it's set up, they should have accounted for those because obviously, uh, you know, you can expect this these sudden changes to occur while you're doing data collection. And then uh, macro texture. So uh, this this has been ongoing for you know several years now, where uh, the lasers uh, or the image the images are they don't have the ability to recognize different macro texture, which is essentially aging of asphalt. Um, whether it's medium severity aging, low severity, high severity aging. Um, is there more exp exposure, of course, aggregates, so on and so forth. So macro texture, micro texture of the asphalt is certainly something that um, until now we haven't seen any of the um, and any of the uh, systems out there who are able to recognize it while doing this data collection. So, uh, in summary, we've gone through kind of, you know, where and what we've seen these challenges. Uh, any questions at this point of kind of what you've seen? Anything, everything makes sense? So the problem with this one, with these kind of instances is that you don't pick them up. Yes. This one and the patch ones, you don't pick them up. The ones we discussed earlier, you're essentially picking up too much of it. Uh, or picking up incorrectly uh, the ones that actually are not supposed to be picked up. Yeah. So it's a mix of both. Sometimes you overestimate, sometimes you underestimate. Uh, it could be, it could go either way. And when you mentioned the double counting of some distresses, uh, how does that happen? Because in one image you would get one distress, right? Yeah, so for example, um, let me give you an example. Uh, this alligator cracking, so you see these blue patches Blue patches are essentially saying that there's some raveling going on. So you're essentially saying that this area is raveled as well as there's alligator. Uh, then if you see a manhole, you're essentially saying that out here there's raveling, there's bleeding, and there's cracking. So on one particular thing, it's recognizing three distresses. But even on an actual distress, um, I, I, well, I, I, I don't know if I have an actual uh, correct distress here, but even on an actual one, maybe maybe down here. Um, so essentially when you have alligator cracking, then you just call alligator. You do, you do not call the longitudinal and transverse cracking. Uh, so it will, it will recognize it as both in certain instances. Right, and it looks like there is an area distress and a line distress, correct. and that's how you can count multiple. Correct, right, right. yes. So they are, it, it, it will actually summarize and tell you that in this, in this frame or in this picture you're looking at, there's these, these this distresses that exist. And that's how we know that, okay, uh, and it actually marks it as you're seeing here. So that's how we sometimes see that there are layers or two or three layers of different distresses that are counted, which certain standards, again, you know, it depends on the standard that you're following. Some will say it's fine, uh, but some will say that if you call X, then don't call, one, don't call the other one. So it just depends on the standards. Yes? It looks like that all, most of the challenges are coming from the fact that the model does not generalize well. Like if some, some cracks it overfits, some other threads it does underfit. So what, what, like how do you address that, that problem? Like do you, I guess, do you uh, develop the machine learning algorithm in-house or do you outsource to another? So great question. So ACOM itself or rather the position I'm in, we do not generate these models, or we do not even do the data collection. So we hire vendors. So this data, so we are in a good position where we, we work with different data collection uh, vendors. Like, you know, there are many out there that have these systems. They actually do the data collection. Uh, and, and we've got, we've, we've been lucky to kind of work with multiple so we can see if one system working, to the, working better than the other. But most of these issues that we've seen, uh, pretty much all systems are outputting the same. But they actually collect the data, and then there's there's proprietary software that actually like pay metrics and all of those guys. They've actually developed these, uh, who develop the LCMS system, they've developed the software to run it and identify cracks as well. So what we see is just the output. So all of this is actually ran and developed by the uh, subconsultants or our vendors who actually go in and do the data collection and run these, uh, run the data through these uh, softwares, which are proprietary softwares developed by generally the LCMS uh, guys, but the vendors are responsible for putting in the inputs and all of that. Now, when we receive this data, we have to deliver to the client, and we see all of these issues. 
So now the second part I'm going to talk about is the quality control approach was required because we need to filter out all of this. But to your question, um, let me uh, just to repeat your question. Your question was how the actual cracking or classification is done. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think you mostly answered my question. I was very, I mean, because I was just questioning if you guys are developing the model in-house or not, because if it was in-house, like you will just go, if for example, if you overfit a crack type, just you go and collect more data and you train the yeah. model, that will be fine. But now you answered that. Yeah, and I'm sure those, the people who are actually developing are probably, uh, you know, they, well, wherever they've reached till now has, have done that because that is machine learning, right? Yeah. Is actually picking up, sending it and saying, yes, this is right. Putting it through multiple images and telling the machine this is right or this is wrong. And that's how they're coming up. But, you know, um, they probably had started for, you know, something that like state, at a state level where you encounter less of this, but now since this has reached a municipal and county level where you actually see these issues, uh, maybe they're still in development, we don't know, but uh, I'm sure they go, they go through that high level procedure as you're, you're mentioning. Uh, they just probably haven't accounted for everything. So, oh, thank you. And, and our hope is, I mean, you know, we try to convey this back to them saying that, okay, these are the amount of issues, but till we actually Till, till they actually release something, until the vendor is actually using that, uh, you know, we have to develop something to quality check it, which is what we are at this stage. Yeah. So, so in, in the overall, like how, how much the accuracy of the software they give you? Uh, of, of, our, of the quality control software or the... Of the, the software that they, they provide you. Well, you cannot put a... Uh, 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 cannot put an accuracy level because it depends on the street and the data collection, right? So if you drive in the middle of the street, you may not get, uh, and, and there's no pain striping, then you may not get any issues. It depends on the type of street. Uh, if you don't drive towards the end where, or if you drive bang in between the lane, you may not even catch the outer lane markings. If there are no stop signs, you won't see it. If there are no manholes, there won't be error. So it just depends on the type of the street that you're collecting data. So it's hard to put an one accuracy number to that. Um, what I would say is where cracking is there, it can certainly pick up the cracks very well. Um, where I think the limitations is, is classifying the cracks. Um, and, and certainly it's very strong in, in, crack, uh, in, 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 in crack identification, but the other distresses such as uh, raveling, micro texture, um, uh, rutting to an extent and then bleeding and you know all the other non-crack related distresses is where I feel like the limitations of what we've seen the limitations are pretty much there but crack detection is fine and some states understand that uh, generally state DOTs and they would just be like we just want percent cracking that's all we don't want any identification we don't want any classification and now there this system works fine uh, because all that they want to know is percent crack that's all and again, you know, so, uh, but not, but that only works well for state DOTs, but the majority, or a, a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, around the nation, a lot of uh, agencies like counties, municipalities, uh, they are actually adopting ASTM standards. Um, and for that, you actually have a list of 20 distresses, which essentially this software can, or this cracking can just satisfies three to four of them from the 20. So, uh, you know, that's where the main limitation is. Any other questions? All right. So, uh, in, in order to, uh, to see uh, or to resolve or to try attempt to, you know, better the quality of the data that we are receiving, we, we said, okay, in, you know, initially even we were doing a random sampling approach where we were like, okay, let's just pick a certain uh, certain uh, network, let's pick a certain uh, street and let's just look at it. And if it looks good, it's good. And we'll do, we'll pick about 10% of the data and we'll say, well, let's just do it. But there was no, there was no thought behind picking. It was essentially trying to be unbiased and fair and just do a random sampling. Uh, what we saw is that is really not working out because there was sometimes we were missing large amounts because the the, the issues that we've gone through are really specific. You know, they may not be a cobble street everywhere in thousand miles, maybe like 10 miles of it. And 
you will never encounter it or there's a very low chance that you would just stumble upon a street that has it. It takes a lot of time to go through even one mile of data uh, because you're essentially going through 10 feet of images while doing data quality control. 10 feet and in a mile you have 5,280 5, feet in one mile. Imagine 1,000 miles. So the data, the, the, the data QC takes a lot of time. Plus, these are gigabytes and gigabytes of high definition imagery. There has, there's lagging, there's the software, all of that. So, you know, you can be sitting there and clients don't want to pay that much for quality control. They'll be like, let me just take whatever's outputting. Why do you need this extra step? Uh, but at the same time, they want, they, they want high quality, but they don't want to pay for it. So, you know, that's what we have to deal with in, you know, when working with them. And we're like, okay, we'll come up with a, you know, a more cost effective or a, a better solution and in, in looking for these answers we kind of have to s scratch our head and say okay let's come up with a more systematic way we can better the quality it's not perfect let me tell you that it, it it's definitely a much bigger improvement from what we get uh, there's certainly more room for improving more at a back-end stage where you're actually doing the initial first step rather than the second step so let's you know we'll go through that and um, we'll see how uh, how, how we kind of did it. So again, the main object of this is to develop a systematic approach for quality control of automated payment condition data. So more than a random or more systematic approach. And then this study, essentially the systematic approach is performed on the complete data set. So the approach that we used essentially is looking at the entire data set. Uh, well, we're not looking at the entire, let me step back. We are running the analysis on the entire data set, which will then flag areas that need to be looked at, which will then be verified based on the known challenges and the deficiencies that we've just spoke about. So now, instead of you know just looking at a certain mileage and not absolutely ignoring the rest, we are running the data using these, uh, what the method we'll discuss soon, the entire data set, and then that will flag based on you know our known data trends and then we'll look at those and, it'll, and we'll see, okay, is this correct or incorrect? So essentially it's a more statistical based quality control. Uh, the quality check on a complete data set, in investigation of these distress patterns through data trends. And we'll go through some of the trends uh, in the next few slides. What we generate is a library of over 100 different data trends um, that, we, that we built in. Uh, we do age versus condition comparison. Uh, we use our software, our base software. We developed an in-house our base software tool to run this because we needed a really uh, a software that can really gather or capture or run quick analysis on 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 so much of da data. Like you ha you have spreadsheets and spreadsheets of just data. Right, rutting data is calculated every foot. Uh, every foot of data has a rutting value. So imagine in, in, in 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 miles, how many rows of just data that you have. So we need some you know, sound uh, which would not crash and would give us quick analysis. And then the flag sections, uh, based on the trends that we'll discuss soon, uh, will be, would be reviewed manually. So again, we are adding a manual component to it, which needs verification. But now, instead of just doing random sampling, we are, uh, we are adding some method to the madness, if you want to say is we're actually filtering down which ones need to be reviewed uh, based on an initial step running through a uh, you know, software that uh, looks through data trends that we're going to discuss. So some of the data uh, trends or patterns, again, we're just going to share a few, but we've developed over 100 that, we, that we've entered in, and we keep developing as we see new, new trends. Now the good part about this is this, these data trends are just to flag. So, uh, it doesn't have to be perfect or we don't have to scratch our brain and think about it, okay, are these trends right? These are just to flag because after we flag and after we filter down, we are essentially doing a manual review, but we are saying specifically go and review this particular location. So that is essentially cutting down a lot of time than just going and randomly opening up and say, okay, where do I start? Um, high severity distresses such as alligator, cracks, potholes, raveling, uh, would be uh, if it's observed on payment sections less than five years of age. So that would be one of the trends, where if you see any high severity alligator cracks, potholes, uh, 
traveling, if they are observed on pavements uh, which are less than five, five years old, then fly it because that is uncommon, right? So the cobblestone example or the cone example, those will be flagged uh, because those are brand new pavements and now you're seeing high severity distresses of that. So that will fly. Potholes observed that the only distress type present on a sample area. Now, very rarely you'll see a good road and you'll just see one pothole there, right? You'd rather, you'll see some cracking, alligator cracking, etc., and then you'll see, then you might, then it's okay to find a pothole there, but just having a pothole and no other distress type, that would be uh, one of the flags. Alligator cracking present without longitudinal and transverse cracking. So again, generally, you see alligator cracking, it evolves from some longitudinal, generally, uh, not necessary, obviously fatigue, wheel path is fine, but when you see from edge, or when you see from center line kind of closing in, then you would expect to see some other linear cracking, uh, some other longitudinal and transverse cracking recognized by the software. You know, it may not actually be, but it's, you would see some cracking in and around the alligator that is probably classified or recognized by the uh, software as uh, LNT. Potholes that are, you know, we, Similar to point number two, portals are observed with other load-related uh, distresses such as alligator cracking. So again, they should exist with some uh, uh, portals if they exist with some other load-related distresses. Because generally, once the alligator cracking becomes high, then you see delamination of the asphalt pavement, and that is essentially, in, in regular circumstances, results in the portal. And presence of significant rutting distress in small localized areas. So generally, you know, yeah, you could have at an intersection or at a traffic light rutting, but if at all you have like a continu generally if you have it over a long stretch, you'll see rutting along at least 50 feet or 100 feet. But when you're, when we see suddenly high jumps of rutting at, you know, five feet or 10 feet, uh, then we know, okay, maybe the vehicle changed direction, maybe it took a turn, Etc. And again, the, these are patterns to flag. So it's not necessarily we are saying, okay, this is incorrect or this is wrong. We're just closing in, filtering down, and saying, okay, now we need to view this. Presence of alligator crack in small localized areas. Again, you know, if at all is there, it wouldn't be just one heavily densely located. Uh, if the entire road is built at a, or a, a certain amount of the road is built at one time, it's receiving same traffic. It should essentially fail equally. So just having a density, high density cr uh, alligator cracking in one area, um, it could be a drainage failure or whatever, um, which is fine, and that we'll verify manually, but otherwise it's pretty uncommon. Um, absence of weathering or aging on, on pavement areas that are older than five years, so we all know obviously that the asphalt pavements, they start aging or um, you know the binder starts getting older. And generally we've seen, okay, at least five years or older, you should have at least medium a low, medium, or high severity uh, weathering, which is weathering is one of the distress types um, that generally triggers uh, surface seals or seal coats. So it's important for agencies to know where weathering has occurred so they can start putting some rejuvenations or all of that, and that's why it's kind of important. Um, absence of distresses uh, on roads exhibiting medium or high severity weathering. So if at all there's medium or high severity weathering, uh, identified then you could expect that the road is probably five years old or five seven years and then you would expect some thermal cracking something else to also coexist uh, doesn't have to be there but you would expect that uh, presence of potholes on areas with no weathering distress so again if there's absolutely no aging happen and you again have a pothole then maybe call for some a second look so those, these are data trends i've just shared a few but we have in terms of percentage, we have in terms of quantities, etc., that we've kind of loaded them up, and we still continue to do so as we get more and more data from different agencies. We kind of keep adding to this library, and we um, we build it up. Yeah. Um, do you manage the concrete pavements the same way? Uh, co concrete pavements are a little bit more difficult. Uh, what we found, and we don't have as much of data on the concrete pavements as yet, uh, because all of this is generally, you know, we have thousand miles of asphalt, or we have now the data dictionary is almost 5,000 miles of asphalt. We don't have that much mileage for concrete to develop. We have started something for concrete, but the concrete uh, distresses don't develop or are not interrelated as much as the asphalt. And that's what we're having a problem to create the data trends. So, you know, for example, a spall, uh, a concrete spall or a corner break, 
it doesn't necessarily that one has to happen for the other. Like for example, like longitudinal cracking related to alligator, related to potholes, that that interrelation is not quite there for concrete. And that's why we are kind of having it a little bit more difficult, but also the need has yet not arise because concrete generally in the agency we are working with is not that much of a mileage. So we could go in and just manually look at it if needed. So till now that push or that uh, uh, need has not yet arised and we haven't even kind of been able to form some trends for concrete as yet. Any other questions? Yeah. Those five years, where is that five years coming from? Is it so generally, client yeah, it, it generally comes from the uh, client. They generally have a historical of when it was last resurfaced, when it was, uh, you know, the work history, essentially, construction history. Uh, and the, these are legacy of databases. So when we are doing payment management, the, one of the few steps initially that we take is uh, getting the construction records for the from the agency. Now, not all roads have a record, obviously. Um, they don't keep it. Not all roads, sometimes agencies don't have any records. So we have to deal with that and make adjustments, but uh, whether it's there or not there, we still have different trends, and whatever's applicable will run that. But that generally comes from the, from the client. And generally in a payment management system, uh, you know, some of them are built really old and it keeps building on as and when work is done. And that, that's how it kind of forms. So, yeah. Any other questions? All right. So what, what, what we build is, again, the R-based software called uh, PDQM's pay Payment Data Quality Management System software. Uh, essentially running on this uh, where we are at, where we are running these uh, it, it essentially takes a CSV file so all of this data quantity type severity is all gathered into uh, a uh, Excel or, or uh, Excel based file which is essentially loaded up into this and that essentially runs through all of those data trends um, whatever we have available in the library and uh, then starts flagging out, okay, this needs to be reviewed, this needs to be reviewed, because of this particular reason where, you know, it could be saying that, oh, okay, there's no other distress and pothole is located, so look at this area, and it will give you the exact specific location. So, th like I said, you know, every 10, 10 feet, uh, the, the payment management data is divided into a frame-based data, so we run it on a frame-based data, which is 10 feet data, so now we know exactly which network, branch, section, we have coordinates as well, but it'll tell you exactly where the file is located and which image to look at, and it, and then we can just directly go to that image and then verify. Okay, this is a cone, not a portal. Remove it and let's go on. So, so this finding and conclusion. So this was based on a thousand miles of data uh, set. So you know we've seen by lane mile how much actually the the change in the PCI or change in the condition that we've uh, that we achieved in this thousand miles of data set. So about 118 miles changed by a PCI from zero to 10. And this goes all the way, there was some over 50 PCI change, which is 50% of the number change. And again, like I said, one and two overall in a network wide uh, system, when you have that, man, that much amount of mileage, uh, these guys budgets for, you know, a, 50, a thousand, 50, 1500 miles is 70, 80 million per year. Uh, to do uh, road repair, depending on the agency, obviously, but on average, this is what you require. And certain num uh, certain difference in PCI or plus or minus five can change that budget by ten million uh, easily. Uh, and and also making uh, decisions on where you need to do what kind of repair, because when we look at the road repair, we look at what kind of distresses are there. Like whether you have to do two inch mill and overlay three inch. Whether is there significant quantity of rotting? Is there significant quantity of alligator cracking? So, not only the number is important, but also how that number generated, because that will essentially trigger your repair. Um, so, getting it right. So, th this is kind of what we saw. So, around two hundred, over two hundred miles, around two hundred miles of data that was actually changed. But again, there was more. Like I said, there was more method to, to the whole system or the approach that we used, which allowed us to kind of, in, in a, in a uh, reasonable amount of time, uh, go through the entire or run the hazard entire data set and, and correct uh, the uh, uh, areas that we found. Now, there may be you know, some parts that are still 
you know that we haven't addressed again like i said it's in development as and more data comes as and more trends that we are we are able to uh, find we'll start loading that up and flagging it and make sure that okay now even this is caught and even this is caught uh, and better and improve and keep improving the data quality system so here it's based on a thousand lane mile uh, but how would this, the 10,000, like if you if you look at the numbers, they are approximately like 200. So how, what's the 1,000 mile? No, uh, so this was 180 miles of data. The, the, the condition number for about 118 miles changed by, changed by uh, a zero to 10 value. Like for example, uh, consider Five by change by PCI point of zero to ten. Uh, zero to ten. This entire set, or or the mileage that you're seeing in every other bar graph, is part of the thousand miles data set. Does that answer your question? How was how was this part selected from the remaining? Based on what these hundred eighty were selected from the thousand? Can you repeat again, please? Uh, well, so you're can saying you that there question? is a big set of thousand, and yeah. the numbers that we see in here are um, are part of the one thousand. Yeah. So the other ones probably did not change at all. So if you sub if you add up this and you subtract it from thousand miles, those that the 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 uh, the, the remaining mileage, the condition uh, index for that remaining mileage did not change. So that's why you don't see it out here. So so about eight hundred miles of data was very good then. Well, out of thousand, that's pretty good, right? Well, it, 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 was, it was, yeah. I mean, it, it, but that's still twenty percent, like I said, and uh, and that's and again, not very good because we how, nobody has verified that, so you can't really say it, the eight hundred miles didn't get flagged or or were not reviewed, uh, visually verified. So it's like I said, this was from the trends and everything for us. For the quality control approach now, since the time that we've developed this, this was last year to now, we've added about 50 more patterns. Now, if we run this again, maybe there'll be more mileage that comes up. So this was at the time where we initially started off and we ran it out, right? So like I said, it'll keep evolving. Maybe the data is good, but nobody has visually looked at that 800 miles and said, this is perfect. The other thing, what I want to point out is, say you have a, uh, say you have a, a payment section which is in 20, okay, let's just say 20 and that has severely alligator cracking. That section certainly does, would, can have uh, manholes or manhole covers which has recognized cracking. But at that point, when your payment section is at a 20, it's got severely alligator cracked, that manhole or whatever is recognizing on that manhole, even though it's incorrect, We've not even taken the trouble to go and look at that because even if we remove that five square feet of whatever incorrect distresses were on that, it doesn't change the number. So we know how the, the PCI or that, at least for ASTM, what goes into uh, the deduct curve and that's open source, it's there in a textbook. So we've studied those deduct curves and we've seen <coughs> where what gets affected. So just in the, in, again, to, to cut down efficiency and time, uh, you know, the, in that 800 miles, there's still maybe incorrect, but a lot of it is not affected that much. Even if we take out that, like again, another one that has say 1,000 on a particular section has significant amount of LNT. That extra bit of pain stripes that is still there, which is incorrect, it's not really affecting the number. So we've not even taken the trouble to look at it. So we've added those things in our data patterns where if at all other things do exist, we understand that what, what problems that we are, uh, we are asking the machine to flag where it can be more problematic and where it can be less problematic in order to save time and go through this more efficiently. Yes. So as a percentage, how many images does your program flag for manual checking and is that number been going up or going down over the years? It's, it's certainly going, uh, well again, I, there's no going up and going down because it all depends on every network. You can only compare it if you run it through the same network multiple times. which we almost never do because once you're done with that, you don't, you never have the budget and time to actually go back unless, you know, the client wants a more improved, but you know, that's a very rare case of happening. 
um, pretty much like like when you say the number of images flagged, I mean it's hard to give you a number, but essentially on a thousand mile data set, we probably have looked at about say two, three hundred images, which is really not that bad. Uh, I, I, I could be wrong, I'm just trying to pick it up from my head, but you know, I, we haven't really kept count of the, of the flags, or the flags have been generated at different stages because we've been getting data as 200 miles, 300 miles, 500 miles, that leads up to 1,000. So I would say about two, 300, maybe a little bit more of images, uh, which is really not that bad because what this software does is it, it, it actually gives you, or you can pull up the image by just looking at the flag. So you don't have to go through everything. The images are connected to that software. So you just hit the flag, look at the image, say yes or no, and close it. And, and, and say how you want to correct it, whether take out the uh, take out the distress or put in the distress, etc. Yes. So far, or for this data, is, that the, is, the, is this uh, let's call it corrected PCI? Yeah. Is it dropping or is it higher? It's generally higher because there are more false positives than uh, you know, and and for us also it's, well, uh, and that's a great question. Because it's what we've seen, it's more easier for us to detect more uh, distress information than lesser. Like for example, a patch that was not collected. It's really hard for us to detect where the patch is that has not been that has not been called out. But if if at all something is called out, we have our patterns are more uh, developed to de to detect false positives than actually things that are not called. So uh, it generally goes up. But there's very less of things that are not called. And that's what we've seen through the imagery. It's generally more because, I mean, certain things like patches and everything, uh, even, even the vendors generally do it manually on their end. So th even they recognize it that the machine cannot call it out. So they do that manually. So generally, the vendors take care of those things that the machine uh, are not able to pick up. But the ones that they call extra, they really don't bother about that. And that's, that's where our problem lies. So it's generally we've seen a higher. For this particular network of 1,000 miles, it, before they actually called it out, I think it was somewhere in the high 60s and then it went up to the closer to the 80s. So it was almost a 10 PCI difference or something. Again, they were in batches, so, um, but there was a pretty significant uh, change in the overall network level PCI uh, through this. I mean, you can already um, see here. So. And, 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 and where, where the problem lies is when you deliver this to the agencies or uh, to the client, when you show them a, a, that you tell them that their roads are in worse condition than they expect, it's, it gives, they have more problem with that. So, I mean, they're almost in like, what, what just happened? We didn't expect this. Because our previous survey, which was done through semi-automated and rating, which was a little bit, that time there was no machine, it was actually a rater doing so. A lot of those problems were not there. At that time, they were, their condition came up to a 75 or, or, or 80, and now they spent all that money in three years, and now you're saying, I'm at a 60. How, how does that, uh, and then they start doubting the process, then they start doubting the technology, and essentially it's just downhill from there. So, you know, we have to bridge that gap in between and say, okay, you know, we're trying to get it closer to what uh, is actually out there in reality. So I have a question that ties to that too. So, like in a way, you fix the false positives. Yeah. But how do you make sure that the false, like you fixed it so much that you're actually reporting a higher PCI? Then, like, because we'll, that will be the same we'll, we'll problem, right? No. Because, uh, so when when we say fixed up false positive, we are visually verifying it, right? So we are not just taking out. So we know for sure those are not correct. The ones that are not called, like I said, the, the, the ones that like say, for example, like patching or weathering, which are not able to be detected, generally the vendors understand that and they do that manually themselves because the, the, the machine has not sorry. generated oh, itself. That, that, sorry. So uh, they actually are going through it in whatever process they want and actually verifying that, okay, this is a patch or, or so on and so forth. Any other questions? Okay. So in 
conclusion, uh, we see uh, a quality control approach uh, that was presented is, again, an improved method. Uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's at least the most systematic than just opening up any random imagery or any random uh, uh, payment sections to verify, rather having it more focused as to what you need to verify and improving the overall quality of the data. Uh, it was successfully tested on 1,000 miles and now even much more, but on this particular project, 1,000 miles uh, on urban and suburban roads. And uh, the results indicate that typical quality, of co quality control approaches uh, are certainly uh, not sufficient to uh, take out any false positives or uh, the incorrections in the data that we do see. Uh, and we've done both methods, so we were able to kind of compare. Uh, initially, the initial mileage that came in, we were doing that, and we said that this is a lot more problematic, and we need to find a systematic method uh, because you know we'll be essentially spend a lot of time if we do the other method. Because essentially, once you start doing quality control approaches and you start seeing small areas of problems, that just keeps growing. Because once you know there's a problem, then you'll be like, where else can this same problem be? Now I want to check everything. So essentially, just sitting there and looking at images, which is not practical and possible. So future development needs, again, like I said, it's, yeah, go ahead. Just a quick question. You, you mentioned about training the data, like you are adding more scenarios. Yeah. So those scenarios, how do you add it? Like it's, it's like image format, like some, some image, no, or it's, like it's, condition, some condition? It's, it's just hard coded in based on uh, values. Uh, essentially, severity, uh, the, the distress type, severity, and quantity is just hard coded into the software as to okay, if you see this, then on, just you know, in, in that in that sense. And the the trends are generally based on just more of experience on collectively the expertise who are out there. They kind of put in saying that okay, maybe we should add this trend, maybe we should add this trend. Is doing manual surveys, doing other surveys, and be like okay. Or, or if we see something and be like, okay, this is, we've seen this in one case, this may exist in other cases, let's add this trend. So that's how these data trends keep getting added in. And there's no, uh, you know, there's no risk in adding it because it's not like once you add the trend, the software automatically taking out the distress. So there's no risk, you can add a trend uh, because you're still manually verifying it. So if at all that trend doesn't exist, so what? You know, it's not that you're doing, you're working it, the software's doing everything. So there's no risk in adding those trends. So looking ahead, again, we said that this is a development, there's a lot of scope for it. I mean, you've seen the challenges, and especially with the, you know, with you guys doing the research and all that, more of the research probably on the image analysis part of it that could help in classifying and removing these false positives. So, uh, you know, I know that that certainly has a lot of scope. So that's, you know, the first point in actually doing image analysis and classifying and doing these distresses. Um, uh, identification and classification which would kind of reduce the pressure on the quality control side of it uh, and uh, and then also having a little more advancement in quality control approaches we are using this trend approach maybe there's something better out there that can automate a little bit uh, but again you know there's there's always room for it and now quality quality is becoming a, certainly a very integral part of any any kind of data uh, as technology is progressing at the same time people are uh, especially people who are there since the manual and the you know the earlier stages, they always have their second doubts, and that we've seen you know especially in this time where we are having a mix of people of uh, the previous generation and now, and they're seeing and they are and we are telling them to trust the quality or this vehicle based completely. Certainly, a lot of doubts are raised by them than anybody on a you know the generation using that technology. Um, so uh, certainly to bridge that gap and then uh, you know. Even even in the image analysis, even in like crack detection and anything else, uh, identification of pavement micro and micro texture. Uh, again, that is something that uh, there are system developed. Not saying that there isn't, but you probably have to run a separate test for that, which is again not practical. So something that can be housed in the current system to do it, because you know developing new system which does not integrate in the current system again may not make sense because they're not going to run data collection twice or thrice uh, to get these small things. They want everything integrated within that. So you, within the current system, how can you better that? And that's, that's all I have.
have time for questions right now, but we do have a meeting to touch with the speaker. So if you stick around, you can have any more questions. So for now, we can wrap up the lecture. Clap again. <laughs> <laughs> Around for a more informal setting, we can ask any questions we have. Uh, <laughs> 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 That's really interesting. I also need to work out the